Welcome back to DAP Talk TV, the open conversation between the Liquid Apps team and the DAP Network community. I am here once again with Nathan Rempel, the principal engineer at Liquid Apps, and we are going to talk today about the cross-chain bridge, and we're going to look under the hood uh, from a technical standpoint of all of the different DSP services being used and what exactly they're doing from uh, along each step of the way from an EOS IO to Ethereum transaction, and then back from an Ethereum transaction to an EOS transaction. Uh, thanks for joining me once again, Nathan. Always a pleasure, man. What, 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 what's the latest before we jump into this? What, what's happening in Nathan's life? <laughs> in Nathan's life? Well, besides uh, trying to launch uh, an environmental campaign to change the world, uh, we're working hard on making uh, these bridges faster with, uh, with some of that uh, tech that we were talking about in our last video. Yeah, so the, we, the last video we put out was me and Nathan talking at a, on a non-technical level. This is going to get technical. Uh, I am not nearly as technical as Nathan, so I will ask for clarifications along the way. Um, there's also a written blog article of mostly the flow of the conversation we're going to have. We're going to have the document in front of us. We're going to walk through it. Uh, we're going to have diagrams up on the screen, and, and hopefully that'll help everyone else understand, even if you're not super technical. But... Uh, it would help if you're technical for this conversation. <laughs> all right, so let's just take a look at the uh, the bridges architecture first. What all services are, are are being used to operate a bridge? The primary services being used is our liquid scheduler tech. What this allows on the EOS chain is to have uh, regularly scheduled tasks, and this is important for uh, sort of synchronizing data between chains. We also have our liquid oracles uh, technology. And what this lets us do is read the last irreversible block of an ESIO chain. It allows us to read uh, data on other blockchains. So for example, we can read the storage on an Ethereum contract, or we can read a uh, multi-index table on an ESIO contract, or we can read um, you know, sort of any blockchain data from any other supported chain in the future. Uh, then we have VRAM. What this does is it allows us to take the information that's being transmitted between chains and write it to IPFS so that we can have an immutable hash to share that between chains so that they can always be assured that the information they were given to them was the correct one. Lastly, we have Liquid Link, which is the signing service uh, that allows ESIO transactions, Ethereum transactions to be signed and in the future, any other supported chain. All right, and with all of these uh, four DAP network services, you could essentially build a bridge to any smart contract blockchain. Uh, we're going to talk about specifically EOS to Ethereum and then from Ethereum to EOS today. But uh, because everything's built in a generic and standard way, a custom adapter could technically be built by any developer wanting to connect to any chain. Is, is that a correct ex explanation? Uh, I wouldn't even say technically. They can build adapters to, to every chain. Um, and that's right. We have sort of four universal components for every uh, blockchain that will be supported. And it's a on message handler. And that's when it receives uh, new data. It has an on receipt handler when it uh, you know, is being told that data it's sent to another chain has been processed. And then it has message failure and receipt failure handlers when for some unknown reason, for example, a ESIO account name that doesn't exist or um, a value that is incorrect, the transaction failed. And so it's made aware of that. And so these four hooks exist for any blockchain implementation. And so anybody who wanted to develop for a, uh, a new uh, blockchain simply has to implement these hooks and use them in the smart contract on that native chain. So there's six steps for a transaction from EOSIO to Ethereum. There's the bridge configuration, message creation, message confirmation, message passing, receipt creation, and finality. So why don't we walk through uh, each each step along the way, and why don't you offer an explanation of what exactly is happening underneath the hood here? So let's start with like a bridge configuration. Uh, if I'm a developer and I want to deploy a bridge, walk me through how to get this thing configured and what all the different variables are here. Sure. 
Um, so to deploy the bridge, we have to deploy a smart contract on both Ethereum and ESIO. And both of these bridge contracts need to be configured um, essentially in the same way, but the ESIO one has some additional information. Um, so on the ESIO contract, uh, it must be configured with the Ethereum address of the uh, paired destination bridge contract. It has to be configured with the Ethereum chain name if you're operating uh, other Ethereum chains or even private Ethereum chains. And you have to set a consensus threshold of how many DSPs must respond with uh, Oracle results to accept incoming uh, messages and information. From there, you have everything set up. You're, you're staking to multiple DSPs. For this example, you'd be staking to three different DSPs for all four of the services that, that we mentioned before. And we're going to talk about the originating contract and then the destination contract. So in this instance, uh, the originating contract is the EOSIO contract. And then when we talk about the destination contract, we're referring to the Ethereum contract that's going to be deployed. Uh, so let, let's walk through a message creation. What, what, what's going on whenever a message is created on the EOSIO side? So when the EOSIO bridge contract receives a token transfer, it takes the memo of the transfer which is a Ethereum address and the uh, transfer quantity and the sending ESIO account. And it packs this into a byte array that can be correctly unpacked by the Ethereum smart contract. This pending message waits for the uh, last irreversible block Oracle to let it know that it has become fully irreversible and it moves into the message conf confirmation queue. Now in phase three, the message confirmation phase, when a pending message has become irreversible, all the uh, pending messages that uh, have reached irreversibility by the uh, time the Oracle request is fulfilled are compressed together as an IPFS object using VRAM. And that IPFS URI is stored on a um, batched message or a completed message um, queue which awaits um, being picked up by the DSP to be transmitted uh, to the Ethereum contract in phase four, which is message passing. So, so far we have the transactions created on the EOS IO chain, and then it, it's confirmed by the DSPs, but it's everything so far up until this point has happened on the EOS IO blockchain. And then uh, some information was also passed to IPFS storage, which will be able to be accessed uh, by the Ethereum chain uh, throughout some of the next steps. So where do we go from here? The phase four or phase four is message passing. So this is where the transactions actually getting passed across chains. So what, ex what exactly is going on here? So um, at this point, now that uh, our pending messages have become confirmed, they've been batched together in IPFS and now they are um, sort of a completed batch of messages. And now the liquid scheduler service is going to find this new batch and it's uh, going to take the information um, compressed there and it's going to pack it into a properly formed Ethereum transaction. This Ethereum transaction is now going to be sent to the DSPs using the liquid link service where those DSPs will sign the transaction and send them to the Ethereum smart contract to um, move that information from ESIO to Ethereum. And all the DSPs, as you said, there's a two, to three, uh, two of three consensus in this specific example. Um, will, so that those DSPs will transmit that information to the Ethereum bridge contract. And once the consensus threshold is met, and all the information being transmitted is the same by all the approved DSPs, um, we would then issue the Ethereum token and move on to receipt creation. Okay, so after phase four, if I was the recipient on the Ethereum side, is this the point that I would see uh, the token show up in my account or? or... That's right. So at this stage, um, the Ethereum destination should now have the, uh, the tokens in their account. If there was no uh, issues with the message that it was a valid account or that it met certain conditions on the token contract. Um, so the recipient would have their token. 
but we now we still have the token sitting on the ESIO side, which we may have to do something with. We may just hold it, we may burn it, but we need to start closing the loop to know that we were successful in transferring that token from ESIO to Ethereum. Um, and this is uh, especially important so that we don't accidentally have a double spend scenario where somebody said, hey, I sent a token from EOS to Ethereum. They did get it, but then they tell you, oh, I didn't, um, and try to get their token back on EOS. So the next step here is kind of closing that gap, and it's the receipt creation phase is what it's, what it's called in the expert guide. Can you kind of explain what's going on here? On the Ethereum contract, we have now um, s attempted to issue the, uh, the token to the destination. There is a try-catch um, hook there that if the token couldn't be issued for some reason, we will now create a failed receipt instead of a successful receipt. And what this receipt is, is we take the message payload that Ethereum received in the first place and we mark it as success or failed and send that data back to ESIO. This is what we do in a token example. In the generic case, the Ethereum contract could send any arbitrary data it wants. It could uh, send deltas of um, you know, token changes. It could send uh, specific information about that DAP. Uh, so the receipt can be anything, but it's specifically keyed to the message that created it and its success or failure. And so then that message um, is written to Ethereum storage and a liquid scheduler job on the ESIO side will periodically read um, the Ethereum contract for new messages or new receipts. And that's where we would go into phase six finality when one of these uh, receipts appears on the Ethereum contract. So then the last step of the process is finality. Everything's finished, but with, uh like with EOS IO, there's like the last irreversible block, which is when everything's final and irreversible. But on Ethereum, they don't actually have a last irreversible block because it's a proof of work blockchain. How, how, how do you decide what is final on Ethereum since it's kind of arbitrary of how many block confirmations do you want to consider this irreversible and final? Right. So what, we, what we've done is on the Ethereum contract, we've built a view function that only shows um, receipts or messages that are over 12 blocks old. And that 12 block number is configurable, but it appears to be sort of a standard representation of um, Ethereum probable finality. Mm -hmm. And so we've employed that ourselves. Now, once those messages have passed 12 blocks and are readable by this view function, the liquid scheduler service uh, on the ESIO side, we'll read these receipts and then it processes them one by one. And now depending on the status of the receipt, uh, you may refund the token if the transfer had failed on Ethereum for some reason, or you might just continue to hold the token, but you mark the, the message that was sent as completed. So now the chain knows that we had uh, successfully sent that message and it had been received and there is no need to engage uh, any sort of manual intervention or refund process because the transfer was successful. At that point, uh, a token provider may also choose to burn the token if it's one that they control, um, if they wanna to try to follow like a burn issue model instead of just a, a hold and transfer model. It's interesting because um, like we, we see and hear about all of this yield farming things and like uh, different ways to optimize yield. And EOS token in particular has a staking mechanism where EOS um, could be staked and with voter rewards and Rex, it's like a three to 4% interest rate or APR, I guess. Um, so technically if you were sending an EOS in particular peg to Ethereum, even though there's a peg on the Ethereum side, the token on the EOS side could potentially be staked into some yield uh, earning mechanism, whether it be native staking, 
which would have a maturation time. So I don't know if that'd be the best way or maybe into like a lending platform like, like Vigor or like Pizza or e Equilibrium where it could actually be earning passive revenue while being locked up uh, as almost like a collateral for a uh, one to one peg of whatever's on the Ethereum chain. That's, uh, that's a very interesting idea. I'd say if anyone were to employ that, I'd consider uh, sort of passing on those benefits um, through maybe not charging fees, for example, mm -hmm. um, you know, sharing, sharing that with uh, the people. Or, but you make a good point that there's a lot of um, interesting implementations that can be done with this. I think it's really exciting the different uh, potential opportunities that uh, bridge providers and um, these different financial implement providers could explore. The critical thing in my mind is to ensure beyond doubt that when people are engaging with the bridge service and they need to return a peg token back to its native chain, that they can always, always, always get their native token back. That whatever uh, implement is being used in the meantime while the token is bridged does not compromise the ability to re, uh, have the original token return to them. Mm -hmm. All right, so I got my EOS IO token on Ethereum. I've got my, my box token on Ethereum or my IQ token on Ethereum, whatever, Shintai, whatever token I just sent to Ethereum. But now I want it back. I want to redeem my token. I got to get it back to EOS. I want to put it back in my EOS account. How does how, how it uh, get back to EOS IO. What, what's going on underneath the hood here? Uh, there's uh, seven phases now. So in the first, uh, iter uh, from sending from EOS IO to Ethereum, we had six different phases. Uh, now we have seven. So what, what's been added to this process here? The difference here is that because we're pa passing from Ethereum to EOS IO, as we discussed in the, 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 the previous segment, the irreversibility is a little bit different. So now on the ESIO side, receipts will have to become irreversible using the Oracle method instead of the, um, the first example where Ethereum receipts uh, were considered irreversible um, automatically by um, having passed 12 blocks and uh, that decision being made on the native chain rather than through any sort of Oracle or DSP intervention. So I think that's, uh, that's the extra piece that gets added. Um, when we look at phase one bridge activation, again, this, this only happens once and it's very simple. It's just the consensus threshold and the consensus members. The consensus members specifically are the public keys for each DSP um, for that contract that that DSP has uh, elected to use uh, for this bridge contract. And so that's all that's required on the Ethereum bridge configuration because all the DSP management is occurring on the ESIO side. And so jumping into message creation, uh, when you send a transfer to the Ethereum contract, it creates a message. Now, of course, Ethereum tokens are a bit different from ESIO tokens in that there is no on recipient hook to create information. So what we have to do is, depending on the ERC-20 model deployed, whether it's a burnable issuable token or whether it's a um, sort of a standard ERC-20 token. So our bridge contract on the Ethereum side uh, supports two different token models, depending on the type of token you're supporting. If you're pegging a ESIO token to Ethereum, you may want to use a burnable issuable token where the bridge contract is an approved minter and burner of the token. If this is done um, and the bridge contract is the owner of the token contract, this means that uh, you as the, uh, as the token holder who wants to send the token back to ESIO can simply engage the, uh, the transfer action where you would um, provide the ESIO account name in its um, sort of raw numeric value form. Now, if you are using a standard uh, ERC-20 token, in this case, you have to use the uh, safe transfer 
or the, uh, the um, approved spender functionality that you may be familiar with uh, when operating with um, DEXs or uh, liquidity pools where you have to approve the bridge as an authorized spender of your token. And then when you engage this transfer method and uh, supply the ESIO account name in its numeric form, it now uses the uh, transfer from, which would fail if, uh, if the token holder didn't approve a large enough quantity for this transfer. In either case, when either of these two types of events occur, we create a message and put that in storage. And similar to the, the previously described um, example, we wait for 12 blocks and it would be picked up in our next phase, uh, message passing. In phase three, we have message passing. And in this case, the uh, liquid scheduler services on the ESIO side are periodically uh, reading the um, next incoming message that's expected from the uh, Ethereum contract. And so once that message has uh, reached the configured um, number of blocks passed, uh, Liquid Oracle service will write that message content onto the ESIO chain as part of the Liquid Oracle service. Once the DSPs have sent uh, that Oracle result to the ESIO contract, uh, another Liquid Scheduler service periodically attempts to process these messages. Now this is an important uh, step to have two separate services because the ESIO contract does not have a try catch process like Ethereum does. And so what we have to do is we periodically um, attempt to process a message. And if the message becomes too old, we assume that it had failed continuously for a period of time. And this is configurable by the bridge deployer as well, and it's called the link processing timeout. Once the timeout has been reached, we would generate a failed receipt in the receipt creation phase. However, if the message was successfully handled and the ESIO token was transferred or issued, we would then create a successful receipt in the receipt creation phase. So let's get to the receipt creation. So uh, what, what's different about the receipt creation uh, coming back to EOSIO from Ethereum? Why don't we walk through the architecture and what's going on here? So interestingly, the uh, next few phases with receipt creation are identical to the message creation in our previous example. Because at this stage of the process, we're now on the ESIO side and messages and receipts are essentially the same thing with the difference that receipts um, have a link to the message that created them and can pass a success or fail uh, condition. And so that's what allows us to close the loop. So we create um, a byte array that can be read by the Ethereum contract once again. However, the information uh, will now be slightly different because we change uh, the ID of the message and we change the success or fail status based on whether we had successfully processed the incoming message. Just like the previous example, because we've created this message on ESIO, we now need to have the, uh, the receipt, the pending receipt, pass the last irreversible block so that it can be um, once again compressed with IPFS and written to a batch that would then be uh, periodically picked up through the liquid scheduler service in phase six. Just like with the message passing of the previous example, receipt passing uh, in this case um, uses the same mechanism where the batched IPFS information from all the pending receipts are um, sent through the signing service, Liquid Link, and uh, converted into an Ethereum transaction and sent to the um, Ethereum bridge contract to move into phase seven finality, where this stage is um, a bit different specifically for Ethereum, but the general uh, concept is that Ethereum receives the receipt and depending on its success or fail status will mark the originating message as completed and it will either refund the Ethereum token 
or it'll uh, burn or hold the Ethereum token in whichever uh, case is appropriate for the, the, the token options selected. All right, so that's basically a step-by-step walkthrough uh, from a technical standpoint of what is going on underneath the hood on the DAP network when you're sending tokens from an EOS IO chain to an Ethereum chain or from an Ethereum chain to an EOS IO chain. But just to recap what we mentioned at the beginning, um, adapters could be built that could essentially uh, use this bridge for any different blockchain. So you think about the different uh, implications here. Imagine being um, a decentralized exchange that could accept or withdraw tokens to multiple different blockchains. Like that's all possible with a generic bridge like that. Is there any particular use case that while building the bridge and deploying the br- or working with the DSPs to help them deploy their bridges, uh, has there any, been any use cases that kind of gets your wheels spinning that you just like hope someone builds and you just don't have the time to do it just to throw the idea out there for any uh, developers listening or watching? I think, I think utilizing this technology to create um, atomic swaps between any blockchain sort of natively creating um, perhaps at ab- more abstract uh, liquidity pools where you could provide like create connectors that exist um, in an off-chain space or in a specific on-chain space by feeding a pool tokens on one chain and another chain and having the connector token or the LP token in a third chain. Um, I think there's a lot of cool things you can do. Uh, You could also have automated um, arbitrage uh, DAP interaction. Um, You could farm CryptoKitties on Ethereum and uh, by interacting on, on ESIO or cloning, cloning them there. Um, and I think there, there'll be interesting uh, DAP considerations where you can have your token, token economics entirely on the Ethereum side, but you can have your high performance DAP operating on uh, ESIO technology or any other chain that you felt was uh, better suited for your, your DAP. And so what this technology lets you do is pick where you want to put your financial implements and pick where you want to put your DAP implements without having to, you know, use the same chain. So you can really have the best of all worlds, have your cake and eat it too.